Webinar Wednesday. Webinar Wednesday. Shaping the way we teach English. Webinar course. Shaping the way we teach English. Webinar Wednesday. Welcome to Shaping the Way We Teach English Webinar Course 13, brought to you by the American English Team. My name is Whitney Mertz. I'm a Regional English Language Officer currently based in Washington, D.C., and I'm excited to introduce today's webinar. Welcome back to all our teachers who have joined us in the webinars before, and welcome to all of the teachers that are joining us for the first time. Here you can see the Course 13 schedule. We really have a lot of great topics to look forward to. Can any of our experienced webinar participants, participants answer this question? During the webinar, you will see moderator Curtis and also moderator Heather in the chat box. But we also rely on the webinar community to help each other. During these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenter. The way for you to participate is by using the chat box. This is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. Of course, not every question will be answered during the session, as there are often hundreds of teachers participating. However, there is another place to ask questions that I will show you in a few minutes. Your presenter may also ask you questions in the form of polls. These multiple choice questions will appear on the screen for you to answer. Some people may experience technical problems. Unfortunately, we cannot fix individual technical issues, but we will let you know if we were having a global issue. If you, do not, if you do lose sound, a great way to follow along is with the caption pod. Webinar courses consist of six webinars. During the course, webinars take place every other Wednesday. Participants who attend at least four out of six webinars receive an e-certificate from the Regional English Language Officer or local U.S. Embassy. To ensure you are eligible for the e-certificate, we will ask you to submit your attendance at the very end of the webinar. Please do not submit it before we, re we request it or it won't be counted. For individuals, meaning you are participating at your own computer, we just need your email address. For viewing hosts, meaning a group of teachers watching the webinar together in the same physical room, we need only the viewing host's email address and the number of participants. Many of you are familiar with our Neem site, but if you haven't registered yet, please do join this site. It is a way to continue the discussions about each webinar topic, interact with your colleagues from around the world, and get access to additional teaching resources. How many of you have already participated in the discussion related to today's topic? On the meeting, we also post pre-webinar resources and questions before each webinar, and we post the recordings and PowerPoints after each webinar. And finally, we encourage you to visit our website, AmericanEnglish.state.gov, where we have a ra wide range of resources available for teachers and learners of English. American English is the home of Activate, Games for Learning American English, which you will be learning more about today. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar brought to you by the American English team at the U.S. Department of State. In today's webinar, we will explore ways to incorporate games into the English language classroom using resources from a recent Department of State publication called Activate, Games for Learning American English. These interactive games encourage students to use English in fun and authentic ways that are relevant to their daily lives and communication needs. It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Jenny Hodgson and Kevin McCoy. Kevin and Jenny are both part of the American English team. This pair work together to develop Activate Games for Learning American English because they both believe that everybody loves to have fun even while learning. 
Jimmy is currently a materials writer and was previously a teacher in Togo, Costa Rica, Spain, Malta, Poland, and Washington, D.C. Kevin is currently a regional English language officer in Washington, D.C., and his favorite part of teaching is creating games, songs, webinars, and just being funny. We are happy to have you both with us. Welcome, Jenny and Kevin. Thanks so much, Whitney. Thank you, Whitney. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Today, it's Activate Games for Learning English. Jenny, I'm pretty excited because in the pre-webinar poll, it looks like a lot of people have been downloading our resources. That is pretty exciting, and we hope that you've had a chance to use them as well. Yes. If you have, even if you have used them, you're going to get a bundle of new ideas today. I'm Kevin McCoy. And I'm Jenny Hodgson. And we'll be your guides today on exploring Activate Games for Learning English. One thing that you might have sort of learned about Kevin and I, but we just feel the need to share with you, is that we, we love fun. fun. So we hope you're going to have fun with us today. And fun in your classrooms later today. Absolutely. So some of you may have joined our previous webinar, Activate Games for Learning American English Part 1. In that webinar, we covered part of the publication, which is called Board Games. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see this webinar or use the board games, you can find them both on our website. And we also covered a second part of the Activate suite of games called Picture This. You might remember these picture cards that also have discussion questions on them. But today, we are going to cover two more components of the Activate game set, Guess What and Word Bricks. There's a philosophy behind Activate Games as well. We developed these games originally in a camp where many kids came, didn't have a high level, level of English, so we wanted to involve them in English language. But make it really easy for them to use and to succeed. So these are some of the things that Activate has in common. You can pretty much put these games on a table and students will spend a lot of time practicing the English language with them. They put students in the center of the action with the teacher on the side. There are hundreds of variations of these games. We're going to show you a few of them today. And we think they work for all levels, from beginners to advanced people. We're going to take a poll now. We want to find out from you if your students play games in groups. So as we mentioned, one of the philosophies behind Activate is not only to play the game, um, but for students to get a lot of practice. And the only way they can do that is in groups. And that makes it a student-centered, not teacher-centered classroom. So are you currently doing this in your classroom, having students play games in groups? That's great. Look at that, 96%. So it seems like we have Activate-ready teachers. Absolutely. Because we intend for each game of Activate to be done in, in small groups. Great. So we'll have to find those 3.68% and have a chat with and, them after. <laughs> that's right. Stay after Here. class, please. <laughs> Finally, Activate is a complete resource. As you can download all the games and you can use them straight away with very little preparation. However, we like to think of it also as a starter kit. It's a unique publication in that we really intend you to add on to it, to add your own elements to the game. And we're going to show you how to do that today. So Jenny, I have a question for you, um, and that's about the audience for Activate. Okay. Who plays Activate games? Who is it fun for? Who is it useful for? And where do you think these things could happen? Okay. Well, um, I'll actually start with 
a lot of times when people first see the publication or see, if you look at this image in the picture here, it's very bright colored. Mm -hmm. um, it might be seem more attractive for um, younger learners or maybe even teenagers. Um, but when you really start to get into the games, I've at least realized that it can be played by almost anyone. Um, you do need a, a little bit of language skills to be able to play in English, but even Kevin and I often play here in the office as native speakers because the topics are so fun and open-ended. So I guess my answer is pretty much anyone can play Activate, and they can play them pretty much anywhere. Yeah. Well, I agree with you there. And we're going to get your opinions now. We want to know if you enjoy playing games. So we're talking about you as adults, as teachers. Um, do you enjoy playing them? Because, again, some of the things that we've heard often is, oh, games are for kids, games are for young learners, this won't work in my class. Um, but I think when we go back and we ask ourselves, wait a second, I'm an adult, and I really enjoy playing games. Um, not only in my free time, but also when I'm at work or in presentations or as part of a group, I much more enjoy the session when there is something interactive going on. So, okay, we have 2.82% of people that do not like games. Mm. Interesting. Well, after today, once they get to experience these Activate games, I hope to. So we will convert them. Convert them and change <laughs> their minds. All right. So actually, I already created an answer for my own question, who uses Activate? And there were so many answers that I put together this word cloud, um, who and where it is used. So I see here you have um, travelers. That's an interesting answer. Yeah, I usually carry the guess what cards in my backpack very often, and then I will practice them using Russian language, actually. Oh, that's really smart. Yeah. So even you could even use them for different languages. Too. That's what I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, something you guys should know about Kevin is he's actually a walking game carrier. He always has at least one die with him, <laughs> some sort of game, and often a toy as well. So he really does love fun. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's start talking about not only these games that we like to play, but how we can use them in our classroom. So first of all, what is Guess What? Guess What is a set of cards. Uh, we currently have 48 of them that are on our website that are free and downloadable. On each card, there is a topic at the very top, so you can see here, at the zoo, in the sky, at the beach. And then there are six vocabulary words related to each topic. So we've already developed eight different games that you can play with Guess What, and each game has a few variations. Um, but I bet there's a lot more games that we have not even thought of yet that could be developed using these cards. So if you do ever think of any, please let us know. We're always interested in learning more games. Okay, so how to play in the classroom. Um, first, the best way to introduce anything new is to model the activity. So first, what I would do is show students what a guess what card is. You can either just hold up an example, um, or if your class is very large, then you can write an example of a guess what card on the board. Next, you would want to do a demo, so a full demonstration of what you want your students to do. So step one is choose a card. Next, this is very important show students that when you are holding the card, they should not allow others to see the card. This is something I've noticed we've had to remind students over and over again. They sort of, you know, just have the card out and others can see, but that really sort of defeats the purpose of the game aspect of it. So it's really important to give examples of how they can hide their card, either by using their hand or given the other ideas how students can sort of protect the card and keep it secret? You can put it behind an, another piece of paper or a binder. Or you can call it secret information. Students tend to respond to secret. <laughs> All right, so once your card is protected, um, tell the class the topic. So the topic in that last card would be 
things in the classroom, right? Yeah. So and you can tell that to other students in the group. Exactly. So okay. the, the large sentence or phrase at the top is the topic, and that is what the describer tells the group, or you as the teacher would tell the whole class. So let students know that they should try to guess the word that you are describing. So describe the first word on the card, and when one student guesses correctly, then you move on to the next card. I recommend for your demonstration that you actually go through all six words on the card to make sure students really understand. Mm -hmm. So, are we ready to give it a try, Kevin? Yes, yes. All right. I get to play a game. I okay. get to play a game. So, the topic is, drum roll please. Things that are round. Okay, things that are round. I'm going to turn around so I can't see the screen. Okay, so I'm going to describe to Kevin things that are round. So Kevin, remember, all of the answers will be things that are round. Uh-huh. First, this is something that is in the sky at this, night. Uh, at night. At that night. That could be the moon. Oh, wow, we had someone beat you. A lot of people beat you. Hey, give me a chance, people. <laughs> all right. Let's just let Kevin guess for this one. Everyone will get a chance soon. All right, the next one. This is something that is on the wall that tells us the time. Uh, a clock. You got it. This is something that, or this is the planet that we live on. Um, Earth. You got planet it. Earth. Um, this is a fruit that also, the color is the same name as the fruit. And it has a lot of vitamin C. Ah, and orange. Wow, these teachers are a lot faster than you, Kevin. Okay. Well, I'm trying to enjoy the game. <laughs> All right. This is something that you use to play almost any sport, whether it's tennis or soccer or... A ball. Ball, exactly. And finally, this is the thing that is on the top of our body that contains our brain. Um, most people are round, although Kevin is a little square. <laughs> a head. Kevin's right. round head. Wow, look at that. Let's give Kevin a round of applause. He did a great job. Okay, so obviously as native speakers, it is much easier for us to describe these um, words, but we still had a really fun time, and this actually is a real game that people play in their free time at home. So, um, yes, it seemed a little bit easier for us, and it will be a little more challenging for your students, but that's okay because that's where the learning is coming in, and this is how students really get a chance to not only sort of ingrain these vocabulary words in their mind, but really practice fluency. You know what I love about this game is students respond to success. When they communicate in English successfully, with one card, they do that six times. When someone guesses, they have succeeded. They're excited. It's they really realize, exciting. oh my gosh, what I said led someone to get that answer. Uh -huh. So it's, it's really a great tool for vocabulary building and fluency. Okay, so the next step after you've demonstrated to the whole class is to get students into groups of three to five. Anywhere in that range is fine. So there's no need to stress about having even numbers of students or even groups. Just tell them, if you're in a group of three, four, or five, you're fine. Um, students do not need pens, pencils, papers, or even desks. Sometimes this actually sort of um, inhibits the activity a little bit because students are worried about writing down the new words. Or um, I've noticed that students sort of are automatically in the habit of doing that, but this will encourage them to really focus on the speaking. Um, so the only thing that they will need is the guess what cards and a way to make sure that the other students don't see their card. Okay, so a teaching tip, actually, and this is something I learned from you, Kevin, and now that I've learned it from you, I've used it many times, and it works absolutely brilliantly. Um, I think as teachers, we know that sometimes the hardest part about getting students into groups is actually getting them into groups. Um, it can feel like a waste of time. Students are moving slowly. Um, but if you time your students and let them know that you are timing them, this will encourage them to move more quickly. So the first time you may want to say something like, you have 30 seconds to get into groups. Um, counting aloud if you see students that aren't moving quickly. 
And then do this every time you are getting students into groups, not just for this game. And students will start to sort of be trained and get the hang of it. Then what you can do um, is to encourage them to move faster is have them try to beat their previous time. So maybe if the past few times it's taken around 30 seconds, Next time you say, OK, class, you've got to do it in 29 seconds or less, and continue like that. So it's just a little teaching tip, but it saved me you know, tons of time in class. It can be you know, from getting in groups in five minutes or so to under 30 seconds. They'll be eager to get into groups because they want to break their personal record. You know, if their personal record is 17 seconds, they'll try to do it in Right, 16. exactly. Encouraging competition is great. So, Another thing that's important for the teacher is to select cards that are relevant for your students and appropriate for their level. So the first thing you can do is to look at the cards and you'll see that there are plus signs on each card. Some of the cards have one and some of the cards have two. Any idea what those signs might mean? Kevin? I know. I want to see if people uh, oh, in chat land, Of no. course they do. The difficulty, level of difficulty. So yes, the one plus is for, they're a little bit easier, and the two pluses are a little bit harder. I'd just like to point out, is this is what the, guess what cards will look like if you print them from our website? And of course, you would cut them into separate cards. So we have those plus signs as some sort of indicator for you, but we can't do all the work for you because, as I mentioned, we don't know your students and we don't know what is exactly relevant for them, even if the level is okay. So, for example, recently I was in a class, and although, so it was a beginner class, so I was just using the one plus cards, but I noticed that in this area where I was, there weren't any movie theaters. There, most likely none of the students had ever been to a movie theater, so this card wouldn't really be relevant to them. So I removed it. And then looking through some other ones, again, if you're in a place where gyms aren't really popular, um, you might want to remove that. Or if your students most likely have never been to an airport, you might want to remove that. Um, things that break, on the other hand, although they probably knew some of these words, the concept of this card is a little more abstract, so I removed that as well. But thought that even though it was a beginner class, we might want to try outdoor activities, although removing skiing because, again, that wasn't relevant to them. Okay. So this would be your job as the teachers to remove cards that won't work for your students. The next step is to have one group demonstrate. So it's important for the teacher to demonstrate, but to really, for us to really feel sure that the students understand, we should also have a group demonstrate. Um, so in, in this case, you would have, you'd select one group. I recommend maybe selecting one of the higher level students to be the describer and have those three students guess. And again, have that group go through the whole process and have the rest of the students watch so they understand. Then the best part of it all. I would just like to say I like this process of demonstration where the teacher does it once and then one group does it. The first time we see how the game is played. The second time we again see how it played. But then also we see the formation that we expect from students. And the rest of the class see those students in the group so that the formation is demonstrated as well. Absolutely. We have a question here. What would be the best motivation techniques before the class starts the game? Sometimes students won't participate if it's just a game, if they will not be benefited after the game. Um, there's a couple answers to this. I'm surprised that students wouldn't want to participate in the game. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about how making these games relevant to your classrooms is really important in just a few minutes. Um, okay, so the best part of this whole process is students play. Um, so your job while students are playing is to distribute the cards. Make sure you have a plan for that. Circulate, just to make sure that students are on task. But as far as I've ever seen, once students get into the game, they're pretty much on task. And then also have a plan for how you're going to rotate the cards. 
So really only one student or one group needs to have one card at a time and you just need to have a plan for how to rotate. So you could say, once you're finished with a card, pass it clockwise around the class or something Or raise like that. your hand and I'll bring you another. Exactly. It's better if groups only have one card, I think. Yeah. Otherwise, they'll be distracted. Okay, so just a quick review. These are the steps for getting students ready to play Guess What? And you can refer back to this later. All right, so I saw someone say earlier, can we create topics? And of course you can create topics. As we said, there's 48 of these cards already, but if you think about all of the vocabulary that your students are learning and all the different ways you can group vocabulary, I think the sky is pretty much the limit in terms of how many different guess what cards can be created. Oh, you should have two or three hundred. Yeah. Um, and we're waiting for you to create some so we can add them to our resource. All right, so I have a few questions for you, Kevin. Yay. Since you've created many guess what cards. Mm -hmm. Do you need special paper? No. I like to make them on a card stocks, um, which is a harder paper, but you can use any kind of paper. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I have used, if you look at the left picture, just I've taken pieces of paper out of students' notebook and ripped them in half, and there you go. I've cut pieces of cardboard up. Does each card need to have six words? I don't see why. I think you can have as many words as you like on a card. Yeah. Fewer words are probably better for lower levels. And you could have up to 10 for advanced levels. It's up to you. Right. Yeah, I mean, and I think even in a set of cards, there could be one card with four and one card with eight. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Can the student, or can the cards include, in, include the student's L1, their native language, or first language? Well, if everyone in your classroom speaks the same native language, I think it's actually a good idea to have a translation on the card. Would you... The main point of the game is actually the describing skills. Exactly. And so I see a lot of people saying no, one person saying it depends. Um, and I think we don't even need to have every word translated, but if there's one that's particularly tricky, you know, have that be there for the student so that they can focus on the translation, and or not the translation, sorry, the description, um, and not get too hung up on it. If that's student, really the focus, it is the fluency. That's right. If a student has never seen the word in English, but the translation is there, they can still describe that word in English, and their friends can guess. Exactly. It's, okay. It's not about memorizing the list of words, right? Exactly. So yeah, I see here it says not necessarily, depends on their level. This is absolutely true. You, the teacher, knows best. You know what will work and what will help your students with this activity. Okay. So back to the question we were talking about before is making it relevant for your students. So these are two images from a textbook. Um, in the first one you'll see it's chapter six, exercise one, and the topic is transportation in the US. And then there's another chapter on family. So we don't want these cards just to be used in isolation as sort of a you know activity at the end of class or you know something as a bonus you can incorporate this into your curriculum by making cards that are related to what you're teaching. Um, and even better is having the students help you with this. So you could make one card that was transportation and list all of these. Or you could think of ways to categorize the transportation, maybe personal transportation and public transportation. And that will really help students understand the vocabulary. And then as a way to get them to practice, use the cards as we just did in the guess what form. But I think just creating the cards and categorizing them will help them learn the vocabulary. So we're basically just borrowing content from the textbook and making guess what cards like we've seen? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I already alluded to this, but who should create the cards? Is it only the teacher? It's great if the teacher create cards, creates cards. I like to. Can but students create? Lot, you can create a lot more if you enlist the students' help. Absolutely. So the teacher and the students can create cards. And in this picture, actually, this group or all of these groups are creating their own cards. We played for a little bit with the cards that we have on the website. But then 
I thought it would be more interesting just for the students to be able to share some of the topics that they were interested in and the vocabulary that they knew, and then they could rotate and play with those cards. You can also, again, have students make the cards related to your curriculum and divide them as necessary. Um, Kevin, how long do you think it takes to create a card? Like these cards, you can tell I spent hours on them. I could, um, it probably takes 30 seconds yep. per card. It took me about three minutes total to create these cards. I actually timed myself. So just to prove to you that it's very quick, we're going to make our own card right now. Let's see if we can... I love with it. the help of the audience. You mean with the help of all these teachers from around the world, we're going to create a guess what card live? Yep. Okay, so it's 8.31. I Let's love even my take job. <laughs> Less than a minute is the goal. All right, let's think of a topic. Any ideas for a topic? The first one I see in the chat box we will use. Body. Okay, parts of the body. Let's do it. Wow, I think this is going to take us even less than 15 seconds. Ready? Go. Um, hand, head. Oh, the, the system is a little slow, but if I was writing on paper, it would be even faster. Nose, feet, waist, waist, stomach, stomach, shoulders. Oh my gosh. Okay, so we can That's see. That's funny for a card, right? Oops. Um, yeah, that's plenty for a card. So think about if you were doing this in a classroom with your students and you just wrote the topic parts of the body on the board and everyone had to create one card, think how many different cards you would have, think how quickly they would be able to do it. Um, so it's, it's really easy and a lot of fun. Okay, so creating cards with your students. So As we mentioned, some of the ways are just pulling out a topic from your curriculum and have students write cards. Another way, if you're just sort of uh, reviewing vocabulary in general, uh, maybe it's getting close to an exam and you want to talk about all the different topics they've learned throughout the year, brainstorm a list of topics with your students. So just ask them to think of topics. Here we have a few examples, countries, adjectives for describing people, email, football, so again, these are the topics that you and the students are brainstorming. You can create a long list on the board and then have students choose their topic and uh, create their own cards. So you would do this on the board, just have them write? Yeah, yeah, I would just start. Or you could distribute pieces of paper to groups, right? Right, well first I would, I would start by just brainstorming a list of the topics on, on the, the board okay. and then having them uh, create the cards individually or in pairs. All right, so we are going to try this as a group. We are going to do an activity. The first thing we're going to do is think of topics for the cards. So just type your ideas in the chat box for guess what topics. Just topics, the All subject. All right, so for whether... Okay. Oh, I love that. Things that fly. Oh, things yeah. that fly. That's great. Uh, things we read, I saw. Oh, I like that. Things um, we read. Hobbies, I saw. Okay. Hobbies? Okay. What else? Uh, it's Politics? Sure. Let's see what comes out of that. Oh, that's going to be hard. Okay. But it's okay. Every topic will succeed. All right, so let's stop with the topics now because we have so many. I'm so excited. Okay. And you're going to start filling out words that will go on the card for each topic. So Look at them go. Bangladesh wait, gets wait, in there wait. first. Nope. So this, okay, sports, weather, things that fly good. Things we read, hobbies, and politics. All right, let's see what we come up with. Things that fly, birds, kites. All right, things we read, blogs, stories, books, venues, newspapers, magazines. Wow, so many. See how easy this is? And you really only need four or five, six for each card, right? Let's see, politics is not very fun. We have speech, politician, 
Foreign, foreign president. Okay. Yeah, I think this is good. And sometimes it's good to have, you know, I think a lot of times we sort of have these standard vocabulary sets that we study in each class. But I think it's good to sort of, you know, change it up. Things that fly, I think, it's pretty creative politics of, you know, getting students to really Dancing. start thinking. And then you see here, corruption, speech, uh -huh. um, and then it might even spark a conversation. So, There's definitely no wrong answer here, right? right. Exactly. Someone... As long as they can say how it's related. Yeah. And it gets people really thinking. I wonder if there's, I think we've done a great job here, and we might actually steal your ideas to create new cards, if that's OK. Um, but if we can go back, I just want to know. Ukulele, Rick. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Um, if we can go back to the presentation, I just have a question for you, which is, is there anyone out there that thinks making these game cards is hard? Um, it seems to us that we think it's easy, and so far you guys have done a great job. But if there's anyone that thinks, oh, maybe this isn't very easy, please do share. All right. And in addition to all of these um, activities that we just showed you, there are other guess what games that you can play. So we've just, you know, in depth gone through the one main guess what game, but there's so many more. And here are just a few examples. The first one, mime the words. So I bet most people can figure out what you do in that case, which would be rather than describe with words, you would what? Act them out silently. Yeah. I would have so much fun acting out at the zoo. I think I can <laughs> do an impression of a lion. And I would prefer your impression of an elephant. My yeah. dad does a really good one. I can. <laughs> A cage is, is hard, too. Yeah, a cage would be hard. But you can do it. Yeah. And so this might be more appropriate for lower levels who might not have the language yet to describe, but do know some of the vocabulary. Kevin's funny. You have a fan. Um, what kind of words are easier Thanks, to Thanks, Jenny Beth. Mime. Um, verbs are easy, you know, like run, bark, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I think concrete things, like especially animals, are easy, too. Yeah. Um, another game is draw to describe. So I think probably most of you know what that is as well, but you would just draw um, instead of use words to describe. So one player would still hide the card, exactly. but then they would draw that object until the rest guess. I see. Yep. And what kind of words are easier to draw? Definitely concrete things, you know, a glass, a pencil. Exactly. So it can be tricky to sometimes draw abstract concepts. So what I like to do is give students the choice. You can either mime, draw, or describe. That's cool. So any way you can communicate that idea is written yeah. on the card is good. Yeah, and so I think people will start to feel more comfortable. Maybe the first time they'll do what feels more natural to them, but then they'll start to try other things. How much fun is that? Yeah, so we can call it mime, draw, and describe. All right, then the next game on there is called Yes, No, Maybe. So rather than having the describer describe the words, the, the describer still hides the card, but the guessers are asking yes, no questions. So the guessers would know the topic, but then they would ask yes or no questions to try to guess what is on the card. So for example, on the wall is our card. Is our topic. Kevin, will you ask me some yes, no questions, and I will try to get to Okay, so I want to find things on the wall. Okay, yep. is, uh, is one of these, does it have writing on it? Yes. Um, is mm -hmm. it um, show appointments? Yes. Okay, does it have months on it? Yes. Is it a calendar? Yes, it is. Okay, so that was a little easy, but... Right. Several students can ask as many questions as they want, and that's a lot of language practice. Exactly. And we included maybe here, because what if Kevin asked me, is it square? Well, maybe, but maybe the calendar is a rectangle, or maybe you have a circular calendar. So sometimes maybe is the right answer. OK, and finally, one more activity is called you don't say. In this case, you are trying to Someone mentioned that the instructions cannot be read. Don't worry, we will have these on the Ning for you. 
So someone yeah. mentioned that you don't say. Um, in this case, you want students to guess the topic, not the words. So we will, but the point is that the describer cannot say the six other words that are on the card. So my goal would be to describe at the beach, but I cannot use the words sand, seashells, umbrellas, towels, bathing suits, or waves. I see. So it so, makes it a little trickier because those are the most common words associated with at the beach. So I could say this This is a place where people go and there's water mm -hmm. and they like to get some sun mm -hmm. and, they and they like swim. to swim. Yep, there's an ocean. It, yeah, it's great practice because you have to find ways around those words. Exactly. Yeah, so it's just another... Um, way to use the guess what cards, probably for a little more advanced class. All right, and finally, um, these are downloadable on our website, so you can download instructions to play the games. The cards are ready to download. Um, we will be adding more and more of the games over the next couple of weeks, so keep coming back. Each, each week we add a new game. Yeah. Okay. And we hope to continue to roll things out. Yeah, so if you have ideas, again, share them with us so we can add your games as well. So that was Guess What Cards. Thank you, Jenny. That sounds really interesting. Um, here's another game. The fourth game of the Activate set is called Word Bricks. And guess what? This is downloadable. Um, on AmericanEnglish.state.gov. What are word bricks? Well, if you down a, download a whole paper, you'll see something like that. And what you'll do is cut those into little pieces so that you have individual words. And these can be printed with two sides. If you don't know how, how to print with two sides, you can only print them on one side and write a word on the other side. But you'll see there's a relationship between one side of the word and another. It could be drink and drank, um, or it could be an opposite, like we see boy and girl. So that when you're looking at one side, you have a good idea what might be on the other side. So those are the materials. So what, what do we do with word bricks? Any ideas? You throw them on a desk. That's what I do as you can see in this picture. Yeah, what do you think you do? Oh, we can form sentences. J.A., wow, this game is for me. <laughs> yeah, form sentences. There's a clue in the idea of bricks. We put bricks together to create a structure, right? Should it be like bricks? Uh-huh. And that's what we're doing here. We're actually creating sentences, I think. So if you see, if you drop these on a desk, students and I recommend groups always, well, automatically, it's human nature to start sort of making, bringing sense to these. So they'll start arranging them into order and coming up with a sentence. This pile happens to have given us one sentence, I am a schoolgirl. <laughs> but that's a good sentence, right? That's perfect English. And when students build a sentence like that, it shows that they are understanding how English works. Yeah, so as you mentioned, sometimes you don't even give instructions. Um, have you ever seen those magnets that people have that are just words? Yes. Every, I have them on my, in my cubicle, and there's no instructions with those, but every time I come in, someone has created a new sentence with my magnet. So, even without instructions, people automatically have the desire to sort of organize them in sentences. Good. Muhammad Tazin says, I do this in my class. And Jocelyn, I guess I brought them in the States. Oh, jo she's talking about the magnets. Okay. okay. I teach like this now. Good. I'm glad no one's afraid of having these and putting them on students' desks. Because if you have 50 students, oh. can you use these tools? Grace says, I think punctuation mark bricks are also needed. That is interesting. Absolutely. Go ahead and add them if you need them. We don't have any in our set, but of course, that's your teacher's prerogative. If you're working with punctuation, 
it's so easy to add them. Well, let's try. Let's just see an, a little example. So here's a bunch of word bricks. Can anyone find a sentence in here? I'm going to see if Jenny can find one, but I'm also going to look at the chat box. I have one that I'm excited about. Okay. It is, I am not old. Wow, someone's got the same one. <laughs> she won from Korea. I'm with you. We and are not Shruti old. Said, oh, don't die I from uh, Aliyah in Kazakhstan. It is cold. I ate the cold girl. Okay. Oh, Rick. Rick. <laughs> I was not well, cold. It's an that's older. a good question. Can you make silly sentences? What do you think? I love silly sentences. It still shows that students know how to put the language together, right? Absolutely. And it's fun. Look at all these sentences we got. And I think it's been less than a minute, and we've probably seen 50 sentences. Uh-huh. She die. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't die. All right, good. I found one, too. Of course, I practiced ahead of time. Mine is it is an old country. So you can see that students would actually be touching these and arranging them. It's much easier when you can move the words into the sentences and more fun. Now, what makes word bricks even easier is Specialty cards. Here we have a wild card, and you see that ES on the other side of that is a simple S. I like to call that a magic S card. The wild card represents any card you want it to be. And this gives us exponentially more possible sentences with our word bricks. So if I have a wild card, that means that I can make that be any word I want? It can represent any word you want. Wow, so then I can pretty much almost always create a sentence if I have a wild card. You can always create a sentence with a wild card. So some of you are saying, yes, we do this in our classrooms. If you don't use a wild card in Magic S, add it, and you're going to see an amazing difference. So Jenny, here we have a sentence. He sleeps. You see the Magic S allows us to, to use the he form. Yeah, he sleeps in that mm, green building. What do you think the wild card could be here? Spectacular. Uh-huh. When I see a sentence like this, I just ask the student, what is the wild card? And they say, that ancient green building. So, I mean, in addition to just being able to be creative, this sort of really helps students understand sentence order. Even adjective order could be practiced in this case. So what if you moved the wild card to after the green? it might be a different adjective that you could use. Uh -huh. So there's lots of different sort of learning activities that can go on here. Absolutely. OK. And here are some of our other specialty cards. This is what they will look like if you download them. So you see what the magic S on the back is ES. And we also have ED, so you could turn a verb like um, like into liked mm -hmm. or Run into run. <laughs> exactly. OK, so we can change parts of speech with these. So let's look. I'm going to show you the power of the wild card and magic S here. And here you can see several cards and, oh my goodness, a tiger? Oh, what well, do I do with that? Well, let's just say that it equals the word tiger. OK. OK, so can you find a sentence in there? Hmm. Cat eat snow. Um, a building in no. A tiger bot. Okay. A tiger bot. What? A cat. But we only have one A. I know. We only have one A. So it's a little bit hard to make sentences here. Let's see if anyone can find a tiger eats a cat. Okay. So, but we don't a tiger eat, eat a cat. Yeah. OK, so people giving sentences, but not grammatically correct sentences, right? Um, so now let's see the power of the wild card and magic S. Now, people, you see that orange object? That's going to represent our wild card. 
Why don't you just have a card that says wild card? Well, sometimes I like to put an object there because it's really easy to find and to remind students that it's a wild card. It doesn't have to be a card. So now you have a wild card and an S. And ooh, now look at the sentence. A, a, ti a tiger bought a building. A tiger eats eat. a cat. Dogs eat a cat. Um, a tiger eats. Cat eats in the building. Uh huh. A tiger in a valley. So not only does this allow us to make sentences, but it really makes students realize that they need that S in certain cases, um, and also these prepositions and articles. I think it really sort of brings that home for students when often they might forget. Okay, really we only have 10 word bricks there, and that's very little for a group to use. So if we increase it, we're going to get thousands of possible sentences. And anytime you use group work, you should always make sure they have a wild card and a magic S, because this will make the possibilities much greater. Why magic S? Well, as we've seen, we can make third person verbs like he dances. And we can make nouns plural like some of you did with cats and tigers. We can even put S at the beginning of a word. If I had the word end, it could be send. If I had team, it could be steam Wow. or teams. I bet you if you didn't even tell students about that, some smart ones would start to figure that out and get really creative. They would. And with magic X, we can S, we can really focus on corrections. And we'll see that in just a minute. So someone's saying S plus N. So S plus N would just be the word send. So yeah. Just spelling new words, getting creative with the magic S. Yeah, the word send. Okay. So this is about the only game in Activate where I really expect students to make correct sentences because it's kind of a form of writing. Yeah. So if a student makes a sentence like this, this is boring building, uh, this is boring room, what do we do? Hmm. Well, I'm going to walk up to that desk. They're going to show me their sentence, and I'm going to put my finger someplace where there is a difficulty. I will never say what they need to correct. Exactly. Getting students to realize it rather than just the teacher always correcting it will be more meaningful. No matter how much the students ask, just say something's missing. Now they may correct, they may say there may be more than one way to correct, so just point out the problem and students will find a solution. And it could be the, right? It doesn't have to be a. It could be the, right. Yeah. So they must find their own solution. So you can see Sooner or later, they will use an A. They'll also get used to reaching for their magic S, which is wonder, one of the wonderful grammar parts of this game. Look in the sent, at the sentence the student has found at the top of this picture. He sleep in that green building. Hmm. Once again, we want to put our finger down somewhere, probably on the word sleep. Yep. We don't tell what students they need, what students need to correct. But they might add, he sleeps in that green building. They might also change the word sleep to drank, right? If you said he drank in that green building, that would be correcting it too, wouldn't it? Absolutely. But students will really get used to that S here. And I think that the teachers of the world will agree with me. Students need to do that, right? Yes. So it's interesting because a lot of our games have focused on fluency, uh -huh. but I think this game really focuses more on accuracy, too. It, it good, really does. It's good to have that balance. Because we really do want to build correct sentences, don't we? Absolutely. Now, what about the gaming element to this? You can just ask students to make sentences. Put the word bricks on the desk and they will make sentences. But if you really want to have fun, and have students play for a longer amount of time. Or create sentences more quickly so they're getting more out of it, even if you only spend five minutes. 
That's right. Then we add points. Have teams, and each word brick is worth one point. So how much would this sentence be worth? Three. Mm-hmm. And what if I added a wild card to it? Um, then it would be four points, because wild cards count two. Where would you put a wild card there? I would add it at the end, and I would say, don't answer that, Kevin. Uh-huh, you could do that, and that would be four points. So we have some questions about nonsensical sentences. And here we have someone say that, Heather, oh. moderator Heather says, um, I think if they're grammatically correct, nonsensical is okay. What do you think, Kevin? I love nonsensical uh, <laughs> sentences, I mean, if they're funny. If they're just words together that have no kind of grammar orientation, that don't make sense at all, no. They have to be a c complete correct sentence. But they can be funny. They can be funny. Not and I'll show you an example in just one moment. But here's one group score, okay? So for each correct sentence, students get points for each word brick. Wait, this is one group score? One group. These were 13-year-old girls who had a low level of English, and yet they got 249 points. Wow. That's a lot of correct sentences. As soon as you finish with one sentence, you can mix up the word bricks again yeah, and start from the... Something about um, not only a timer but keeping score is so motivating. I'm a native speaker of English, and I play a game like this on my phone where I try to create as many words as possible I mean, even the word cat, for some reason, when I'm playing this game on my phone, becomes exciting. Does anyone else play games like this, even in your native language? Yes, I see a lot of yeses. Yeah, so for some reason, as we know, as adults, as you know, fluent speakers, we have fun. So, of course, your students are going to have fun. So it's real healthy competition, I think. Not only for groups to compete against each other, but to compete against their own score. Let's say one week they got 249 points. Next week the same group is going to try to get better, right? Absolutely. And they will. Now here's a picture of I'm keeping score for three different groups. You see the doves, the butterflies, and the four cats. And I'm adding up their totals as we go along. And you'll see on the right-hand side there's a sentence. You will find your silver head. I just happened to write that on the board because one group came up with that sentence. It doesn't make sense, but I think it's a fun sentence. It is a fun sentence. And it's worth six points. So I'm guessing you were the teacher. I was the teacher. Is it important for only the teacher to keep score? No. I like to run around the classroom, so I keep score. But sure, students can run up to the board themselves and keep score. Exactly. So if you have a class of 50 or 100, it's going to be really hard for just the teacher to keep score. So I think getting students to keep score or maybe, you know, keep score for the other team so that everyone's, you know, checking each other's work would be a great idea. Exactly. That's why I like to keep the scoreboard visible because then everyone can see the other group's scores. If you exactly. just have it on the table next to the students, it's not as exciting. Exactly. So having students keep score, especially in large classes. Yeah. Okay, so if you go to AmericanEnglish.state.gov and you download our word bricks, there's about 12 pages and it's 120 words. I think 200. it's about 120, double-sided, so 240 words. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is the unique thing about Activate, is that material is sufficient for you to play with, but it's not quite enough because there are not very many nouns. We want you and your students to add nouns that are important to you. So you can see some official word bricks in this picture in front of you, but also students have just written on papers adding interesting words like penguin and silly. You add them together and you get something like this. You see all those new words? Do you see anything else that has been added here? I see, yep, uh, the Eiffel Tower. I see an image. The U.S. Embassy in Luanda has identified the Eiffel Tower. An image, can we put pictures with our word bricks? I think so. Why not? 
It's fun. It's visual. Okay. So we could make a sentence, the Eiffel Tower is a building. Now look, do you see anything else that's been added? Wow, I see a lot. I see um, an object, which is very clear to me. It's a zebra, so I would assume that would be zebra. Yeah, zebra can rep represent the word zebra. I see a, a card that has been drawn on of three little kids, so it could be children or kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then I see an object that I'm not quite sure of, so I might think that's the wild card. Yep, that will be our wild card here. I see your name. And my name. Why would you put your name? Because it's more fun to make sentences when you personalize them. Students can put their names in, or the name of the teacher, Absolutely. the name of their, their favorite TV star. Yeah, I think that definitely makes it more fun. And one more thing I noticed is you circled the S. Just so that students can find Magic S, because it's such a valuable card. OK, got it. So here you go. Uh, as I said before, when you drop so many pieces of paper onto a desk, you want to make sure that every group has a wild card. So you'll see right there, I might just say, here are your wild cards, and put two of them on a desk. We have that little flower and pieces of clay. Those red things are pieces of clay. It's not tuna. Play-doh, that's right. It's not sushi. <laughs> and so students will just use those as the wild card. It makes it much more e much easier to distribute these to each group than to find little wild cards. Exactly, and they're yeah they're much more noticeable. And when it's something sort of nondescript, it's easy to just use that as your wild card. Yeah, an eraser will work. A coin. But look, you don't need to use pieces of paper and on. What are those? Those are beans. That looks like my dinner. Yeah, and you can write words on both sides of the beans. So. Add these too. Yeah, so I think a bag of beans here costs about a dollar, so that could be a easier way if you have if it's difficult to get to a printer, write them on beans. Every classroom I walk into, I have 400, 500 beans. Yeah, in addition and to games, <laughs> Kevin carries around beans with words on them. So if you see them on the street, you can ask him to play. And stones work really well too. You see. Yeah. So, adding to the game, DIY, do-it-yourself tips. Have students make their own word bricks. You can use stones, plastic, cardboard. You've seen us incorporate small objects. But here's the main thing. Collect them. You can have a box. You can have 500 word bricks, 1,000. It is very easy to collect them and keep them and use them again and again. What about um, building word bricks into the curriculum? Could we have students get into the habit of every time they learn a new vocabulary in class, quickly create a word brick and you have the word brick somewhere in the classroom where they could just add it to immediately? Yeah, it's great to have a box. And if you have new vocabulary, you should make five word bricks of each word. Yeah, does it or matter ten. if you have? 50 of the same word? No, it's great. So we're going to try playing a little word bricks with you people. You can see some teachers here in Indonesia playing with word bricks. So so here is our collection of word bricks. Let's say that you got this on your desk. You're a team. I want to see how many sentences you can make from this. We see that orange thing. That's going to represent a wild card. So we actually have two wild cards here. Why not? More sentences are possible with two wild cards. OK, so are we going to try this as a group? We're going to try this as a group. Now, everyone. If your name begins with A to F, you can write a sentence in that box. So find what your first name begins and start creating sentences. So we only want to see complete sentences, but of course they can be nonsensical. So school food is cold. Okay, and I also want they have to be grammatically perfect, right? 
Kevin rides a zebra to school. That is absolutely true, in fact. So we don't need to see the letter of your first name. We just want you to find the correct box and make sentences based on your first name. That will determine your group. And Jenny and I are going to call out some great sentences here. The bad children ate chocolate. Children relax at school. Um, children ate at school. That's a good sentence. The bad zebra ate some clouds. I love oh, that. The bad zebra ate some clouds. I'm writing that one down. I'm going to put it okay. in your office. Let's see who can get the longest sentence. Oh, she went to sea with friends, ate food, wrote poems. Wow. Mm -hmm. I read magazines every morning. She might think there was bad food for children. I think children go to school. Good. So every time students get a sentence, they raise their hand or say, Kevin, and I go and I check it. I check every sentence before they get points. If you have a really large class, are there any other ways you could help manage that? I think I would maybe select a few student moderators to uh -huh. help, and they could check. And of course, if they have questions, they could check in with the teacher. But you might need helpers, and I think some of your sort of more eager students would be glad to do it. Jenny, do you think you could do Word Bricks with a class of 50 students? I think I could do Word Bricks with a class of 100 students. Really? How would you do it? The same way I would do it in a class of 10 students. Um, students would be broken into small groups. Uh, they would be given Word Bricks, and I would circulate. And as I mentioned, I would probably ask a few volunteers to help move Word Bricks around. So. Um, you know, taking some word bricks from one group and moving them to the other so students get new words. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think... Really, with 100 students, you, it's only 20 groups of five people. Exactly. So you're only managing 20 groups, which I think is easier than managing 100 people because Absolutely. each group is doing the same thing. Each group is going to be on task because they're going to be so interested in making these sentences. You can see how our audience right now just keeps making new sentences. Yeah, and I think most of our games, you don't really need a lot of space. You don't need necessarily a desk that seats four people around it perfectly. No. Um, I've seen all of these games played in a variety of ways on people's laps, um, on chairs, on the floor. So I think you, we don't need to worry so much about the perfect formation. Just quick groups, no. um, get them playing. You can play holding a binder and putting your word bricks on a binder. I often try to play word bricks without chairs because I think chairs get in the way in the classroom and people can stand around the desk with word bricks. Exactly. It's more comfortable. We've seen so many sentences here. Probably, I, I don't even I know. You guys got thousands hundreds. of points probably. Yeah. So. We're going to try everyone. to keep score, but you guys are too good. Yeah, you're too good for us. Okay, so you see how word bricks works. And that's just one game. Um, whatever game you do, I suggest you play in teams. Each group should, have, should clear a playing surface. As Jenny said earlier with Guess What Cards, forget the pens and paper. They get in the way. All you need is a playing surface and word bricks. Um, give points to create friendly competition, right? Absolutely. Each team needs a wild card or two. If they got lower levels, give them more. Okay. And to keep things fresh, take some word bricks off of somebody's table and put it onto the next table every few minutes. Just Someone keep said rotating. How to score it? Well, I say for each sentence that's correct, don't answer. That's a sentence with two word bricks. Give that group two points. So you get one point per word in a correct sentence. But you can score it any way yeah, you like, that's really. that's one option. And how many bricks do you think you need for a group to function? Well, I, obviously, I think the more the better you can get more creative. But I was also thinking when we were back on that slide with only 10 word bricks, I think in that case, it really helped bring home certain points that you were trying to think about, like the magic S and things like that. And, and students really have to think and get creative, and it's actually a little harder with fewer bricks. 
Mm-hmm. So I think depending on what you're doing, anywhere from 10 to unlimited. Yeah. I think the more the better. Um, these girls here, these four girls, they have 37 bricks, and they do have a magic ass and a wild card. With 37 bricks on both sides, that's 74 words. They can make thousands of sentences. Whoa. So we've just been talking about sentence race. Yeah. That's the one that we have been describing, sentence race. And there are many possible games. And instructions for these games will appear on American English at state.gov. We release them one at a time. And you can see some of the different games that play here, but you could make up literally hundreds of, yeah. of games. Again, I think the sky is the limit, and if you do come up with more games, please do share them with us. So those are just descriptions of some of the possible games. And you'll be able to access these slides on the Ning, so you can go back and read the instructions. Um, <clears throat> What do we like about Activate most? Well, look at, these are teachers here from Indonesia, Indonesia playing one of our board games. And all of them are involved and smiling. Yeah, I think, again, that's what we keep coming back to is, yes, we love fun, but fun that also encourages learning, um, sort of has students on task without even really us needing to continue to remind them. Make sure you're on task. Make sure you're doing this. No, students want to be doing these games. That's what I've always seen. Um, we, we think that Activate is great for teachers. Why do we think so, Jim? So, yeah, like we said, not only are these games great for students and great for most levels, but they're great for everyone, including teachers. Um, I've seen a lot of workshops done with teachers using Activate. Um, not only do teachers get the chance to play them and see how they work in their classroom, but I think it really brings home the point of um, fluency activities, working in groups, the importance of open-ended conversation questions, um, the importance of competition, how it makes students work faster. Um, it also sort of reinforces critical thinking skills. So when you do have these questions that don't have a right answer, sometimes students get a little freaked out. They want to know the right answer. But as they get more um, used to playing these, they'll see, oh, it's about what I think. And that's the important part. So, I mean, there's so many different great aspects of these that can be used in teacher training seminars um, with students, with teachers, with friends. The for, list goes on. For me, the most important thing that Activate teaches teachers is to relinquish the central role in class. It teaches you, you don't have to stand up and talk the whole time. Two comments I've seen in our chat box. One is, too interesting for class, and it is scary to lose control. Well, you give students the central role, but you don't lose control with Activate because the students are completely involved in the task practicing English. Yeah, and something that we posted on the Ning and, and have talked about in the past is just because a teacher is talking and the students are quiet does not mean you have control because you can't control their minds. They could be thinking about something else. They could not be listening. So it may appear that you have control, but there's no guarantee that you actually do just because they're quiet. Okay, so today, as a reminder, we talked about guess what? We talked about word bricks. And in our previous webinar, we talked about board games. Here are some of the examples. And I hope these look familiar to you, because if they do, it means that you have been to American English and you're downloading these, printing them on pieces of paper, maybe laminating them. That's what I like to do. Then they last forever. And guess what? How much does it cost to download these things, Jenny? They are absolutely 100% free. You don't even have to register. You just go and click on it, and you can print them yourself. And again, there is a full webinar on how to play these games in your classroom. So if you're still feeling a little unsure, they are there ready to go. 
the webinar is there for you. And as I mentioned earlier, at the very beginning of this, one of the most important things of, as, uh, of, of Activate is DIY. What which does means DIY Jenny? mean again? I want to ask our audience if they remember. DIY. Anyone know? They know. We Do it ask. yourself. She won from Korea. Do Activate. it yourself. So Activate was created with the idea in mind that the Activate games themselves are models. They're models for you to follow. They're easy to make yourself and to add to. Yeah, we you know, keep talking about, yeah, we have some examples and they may work for your students based on what you're teaching, but they may not. You need to build these things into your curriculum. We always hear that teachers don't have enough time even to get through the curriculum. Well, these are not meant to be separate. They should be a part of what you're teaching. So if you're teaching, for example, the second conditional, I think it can be very easy to create your own game. For example, the, the topic of the game could be if I had dot, 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 and then in each square you could put a million dollars, a husband or wife, a dog, a boat, etc. So a donut, if I had a donut. Yeah, so there's the sky's the limit, and it's very easy to make. Again, students and teachers alike can make the games, and it's much more useful if it's something relevant to what you're teaching. This model or template is available for download on our website. Or start from scratch and beautify. Here is a teacher, Dvita, from Indonesia, who went to an Activate workshop about our materials and then created these really beautiful games. Look at that. That's beautiful. Or you could take whatever materials you have at home, or in this case, what, what I found on the street. What is that? <laughs> That's the lid to a pizza box. Oh, I bet you have a lot of those at home that you could work with. It was even from home. <laughs> so you can make your own beautiful games, or, as in my case, you can just make a game really fast that's not beautiful. Yeah. That's exactly. one that I made myself, and it works. It's not beautiful, but it works. Practical. So do it yourself. Picture this cards. We've even got some people from around the world creating their own picture this cards. These have pictures on one side and questions on the other. So look, these came to us from Burundi. Wow, those are beautiful. From one of our great English language fellows there, Jody, and her teachers. So you have kinds of building in Burundi, and on the back, questions about buildings questions about work in Burundi. So again, these might not be relevant for the world, but they're more relevant for the teachers and students in Burundi because they're vocabulary words that they actually have to use. So again, making them personal is really, really important. Super. So activate. There you have it. Four games that you can use in your classroom. And if you want to watch the other webinar on board games and picture this. You can go to our American English YouTube channel or watch it at the Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar series at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. So we do have one challenge for you and we hope you'll take us up on it and that is to create your own Guess What cards and share them with us. Um, there is a Guess What template on the name and after this, we'll be sharing some instructions on how you can submit these. Uh, but we'd love to see your ideas, because we, we already know that you have a lot of great ones. We saw them today. And we've, you're, if all of our teachers are each creating at least one guess what set of cards, we have a lot to share with each other. So more on that soon. And another request. Send us your photos. If you've got action shots of you and your students playing, like these great kids in South Africa playing Picture This, um, send us those pictures. Or action shots of your students making Activate material, like those cards from Burundi. I'm going to show you some examples here. Yeah. Um, we already have a lot of friends of Activate. I think our first friend ever is Rick Rosenberg, who is currently in Brazil, but at the time that Activate was developed, he was here as our, our, our leader in getting this publication 
ready for the world. So Activate's first friend is our friend here, Rick. Rick brings us the name Activate and stood up for this publication. And he also plays ukulele, which is okay by me. <laughs> the more friends of Activate, we have Board Games in Brazil, Word Bricks in Indonesia, Picture This and Word Bricks in Mexico. Uh, English language fellows, we already mentioned our friend Jody. Jody calls herself an Activate Ambassador. Um, she spends a lot of time training teachers in Burundi how to use Activate. She's an Activate activist or an <laughs> Activatist. And we hope that you will all be Activatists. And here we are in Indonesia again, is that right? Yeah. With Activate board games, those students are having fun. So this is board games in Burundi with Jody. Um, These teachers are Indian in New Delhi, and they're making board games on, guess what, a pizza box. <laughs> Picture this in South Africa. Wow, look how engaged they are. Mm -hmm. They're having a lot of fun. Oh, and this was the longest sentence game from Word Bricks. We were using themes at the time. That's in Jordan. That's a long sentence there. Here are some teachers playing board games in Togo. And these teachers, as you can see, are not using a desk. They have a piece of paper on their bag, and they're using coins and other pieces to play the game. So proven that you don't need a lot of space to do this. Yeah. But Tanya from Brazil sends, uh, says, I will surely send pictures. Good. I can't wait. We're going to hold you up to that. Everyone else, too. And look at these kids so interested in playing Guess What? The and describing game. I actually put this picture for you here, Kevin, because I thought you would like how they are. Because they're not sitting down. They're not sitting down. I really like when people learn standing up. Kevin stands up all day at his desk. Uh, on a good day, yeah. So... Uh, we thank you all for coming to our Activate webinar, all you new Activate activists. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually sad to leave. I want to play Activate all day, um, but we can't wait to see your photos, see your guess what cards, talk to you more on the Ning, and just hear about how you're using Activate in your classrooms. Thank you so much for all you do as teachers around the world. Um, that's why we're here to support you, so thank you for for everything. Bring it to class and try it with your students. You will never go back. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Bye.